So what our audience don't know is that we've walked into what has been a gushing and outpouring of emotion. You're crying. Um, Jennifer's also quite upset. But, but Reverend, this is off the back of what you were just talking about. Tell us why, even at an event like this that feels so clinical, that feels so out of any proportion, it's still important to touch people's hearts and their souls when it comes to climate justice. You're hearing a lot of rhetoric. But here we're talking about lives. We're talking about futures of children. We're talking about gross injustice. And all of that's being greenwashed with smiles and numbers thrown around. And if nothing happens, if nothing changes, if nothing concrete happens in the next few weeks, our future is gone. And that's our reality. The climate crisis is fundamentally about the climate injustices, and that is a human rights issue. And I and the problem is, in spaces like this, there is just so much emphasis and resources that are being pool, poured into the narrative of what the implementation frameworks of all these climate policies should look like. It just disconnects so much from the realities of the disproportionate impacts that the vulnerable groups in the global south and also the poor and racially marginalized in the global north are facing and that's a human rights violations. Greenpeace and Greenpeace International have been focusing on the issue of island nations and the issue of uh, uh, social justice as well as climate justice but today feels different in, in, in the presence of you two. Why is that? Well I think look it is about very existence of places, it's about people's homes, it's about their cultures, it's about their graveyards, it's about all of that. That's And that being at stake. And then you have a prime minister, and now we have documentation of this, who was clearly using every mechanism that he has to bully and to divert attention away from him. And I just think the morality of it is just so deep and and it goes beyond yeah it's social and climate and all of those things but when it comes down to it it's like what is what is it's just shameful it's just shameful as i as representatives of island nations that have for too long been disenfranchised or manipulated and your positions used to further the 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 wealth and benefit of those in the global north you must be a little ticked off um, a little bit ticked <laughs> off and I just want to I just want to understand how steady focus and activism is part of that today is an outpouring of emotion but the future is, is something that's that's in both of your minds deeply there is a righteous anger because of the Im immorality of what is happening and you've said it rightly we uh, I mean we're in a place also, Scotland, that has been exploited and been colonized. On just a few days ago, I was at um, a climate change memorial at the Bank of England, right in the heart of colonization and capitalism. And a reminder of what happens when the rhetoric continues. And in this day and age, that's what happens. And, you know, when we talk about the future and for our sisters and brothers that are refugees, you can understand that when things get better in your homeland, you can go back. That will not happen in the context of climate change. Because for many of our communities, already being experienced in coastal communities, in low-lying atolls, there will be no place to go back to. So if we don't act now, if we don't act now, it's over. Thank you, Reverend, for actually reminding us that, you know, a lot of this plays out in our colonial histories and this has explicitly been recognized in international climate law and policy that the global north has a historical responsibility to pay for the damage it's caused and for its continuing emissions that are impacting our lives so significantly and this is what they're not doing. Just for the last question, and before I get to the last point, we in the Global North, I count myself as one of those. Uh, I was a refugee from Afghanistan, but I now benefit wholeheartedly from my life in the Global North. It feels like we almost have to accept, pay reparation where it's due, create frameworks that are based on equality rather than equity. 
Um, and I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that. What is what is what does the future look like for this movement? I mean, I think the future is uh, righteous anger, and I think it's not just that. It's about um, taking the corporations and the company and the countries to court to pay for the damages. Is that what Greenpeace that is committing is, to? Absolutely. We are we are doing it now, and we will continue. Whether it be for for countries, whether it be for youth. There's been a recent decision in in Germany where. The Supreme Court found in favor of young people and ordered the government to increase its ambition to avoid climate chaos there. And that's in Germany. Imagine what it's like in another place. So this is, you know, the, the, the that's, w w w look, whether it be in the courtroom, whether it be in the political lobbying, whether it be out on the streets, we will be there. And we are not going away. And there is too much at stake. And we are strong. Thank you so much for talking to me in Doha Debates. I really appreciate your time.